When the going gets tough, it's worth asking yourself, what are your core values? In the grand scheme, are you living in line with your personal values or not? And although one person might prioritize some values more than another person, it's also the case that a whole group of people in a culture might be guided by somewhat different values than people in another culture. But what are values exactly? Like, I like pizza, but that's not one of my core values, right? I, I mean, maybe, but pr probably not. And okay, I value authenticity, and that does feel like a value, but what does it actually mean that I value authenticity? And why do I value authenticity? Sure, it means that I'll come to admire someone more when they present themselves authentically. But why do I care? And why should you? You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell. And this week, I get to talk to Dr. Greg Mayo. He's a psychology professor at the University of Bath in Wales. And although he's been in the UK for many years, his accent quickly reveals his Canadian origins. He co-wrote the popular textbook, The Psychology of Attitudes and Attitude Change. And in 2016, his own book came out called The Psychology of Human Values. I've always liked Greg's work. And on the few occasions I've been able to talk to him in person, I've always enjoyed it. So this was a nice chance to catch up with him and get his take on the study of human values. I, I thought, you know, one of the things you mentioned, it's a it's a topic you love. And I, for some reason, I had this impression that you had come to looking at values later in your research career. Like you started out looking at sort of just kind of, you know, attitudes and persuasion types of background stuff. And then years later, you sort of stumbled into values. But I was looking at your CV and I was like, oh, values as a word appears pretty early <laughs> in the list of things that you've had out there. So I'm curious, what is the thing just to get us rolling? Um, like, wh what is it about values that you find useful to study? In the very early days, I'd say I was interested in them as a kind of attitude. So that's why there's this overlap between uh, my interest in attitudes and values. So I saw them as being a more abstract attitude and uh, something where uh, we're not just going to look at, for example, attitudes toward brushing your teeth every day or shaving with this Gillette razor or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's, let's look at something really broad and important, like what's your, what's your attitude toward helping others? Uh, what's your attitude towards freedom? And, and these abstract concepts were intriguing to me because people mention them a lot in their arguments for why they favor particular policies or why they take certain stands on different issues. And, and I, and I was therefore fascinated in, in why people feel the way they do about these abstract concepts. But then as I got to know the field more, I realized that researchers in this area weren't calling these abstract ideals attitudes, they were calling them values. And, and I started to discover reasons why they were being distinguished that way. And, and part of it has to do with the kind of subjective standpoint we take when we talk about values as opposed to attitudes. Because when we talk about values, we, we think about ideals that are important to us. Whereas when we talk about attitudes are generally things that we like or dislike. They're things that we, we, um, we, we feel like we might approach or avoid. And they're generally a little bit more concrete, which might dispose them to that kind of orientation. But anyway, um, yes, they, they, these two did coincide for, for me from an early stage. And uh, I guess to, to add one last thing to, to why I got interested in, in them is, is because I think I was fascinated by two things. Uh, one is the difficulties people have in talking about why they feel the way they do about these values. Um, just that they were the backstops for arguments, but rarely could people go further. I was fascinated by that. Um, but at the same time, I was fascinated by their potential to unite people, to provide bases for agreement and consistency. Uh, so that if you said, you know, I think that we shouldn't discriminate because equality is important, 
you would get agreement with that from 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 most individuals, uh, and you would at least get agreement that equality is important. You might just dis- get disagreement about how to achieve equality, or where exactly it's important or how, but you would get agreement on those abs- on that abstract principle, in many instances. So so the 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 combination of having this low cognitive arsenal to explain our values, um, th- this difficulty in reasoning about them, but at the same time having high uh, consensus about them, to me is really interesting because they could be a really useful way for bridging divides in fractious disputes. It, would you be able to give, uh, so you kind of gave a, a definition of values in the context of that, but if we're to kind of zero in, like what, what, it, what do we exactly mean when we say that this is a value and maybe give an example or two of, of what values are and how those, like you said, are different from opinions or, or other kinds of beliefs. So uh, one example of a value might be uh, helpfulness. Uh, an example, yeah. Another example might be equality, like I just mentioned, or freedom, uh, national security, uh, forgiveness, uh, Wealth. These are these are these are some ideals in a common measure of values that was developed uh, several decades ago by Shalom Schwartz. Um, you know, it it in turn builds on prior measures like one developed by Milton Rokich. Uh, the common element of all these values is they're abstract and they're ideals that evolved from their own research projects, uh, establishing that people generally feel that these ideals are important guiding principles in their lives. So when I, what I call a value here are, are abstract ideals that people think could be important guiding principles to them. Uh, so they influence their attitudes, their behaviors, their perceptions. And generally when we measure them, we ask people to consider the abstract ideal. There, there, there are a few different me- methods, but the most common method is to say, um, for example, equality, equal opportunity at all. How important is it as a guiding principle in your life? And people respond on a scale from opposed to my values to extremely important. Now, the one point I should make about that is that most values in, in researchers aren't interested ex- in solely where people place themselves on that scale because we know people tend to agree. But what's more interesting is the relative differences in agreement. And also, how did how did these differences occur across many different values, uh, values that reflect different motivations and different orientations? So, for instance, well, maybe I should get to this later, but there there's a model that describes how values differ uh, in the motivations that they reflect and express, and that can lead you to predict different patterns in how people endorse them. So, so historically, how how have we considered values? Like what? If we look at like the evolution, because values you'd think are like, in some ways it's hard for me to think of because they are so abstract and that is probably what has made them slippery as a construct in the science over time. So I'm just curious, kind of, if you, if you look historically, how have people tried to assess values and, and, and study them and, and how from that would you say you've added to that to say that actually we should be studying values in this, this way? So one of the earlier earliest measures by Gordon Allport uh, was measured values in a way that was more oriented towards looking at their um, their relevance to career goals or life goals. And actually, I think that's where some of the earlier interest stemmed was to, to be thinking about aspirations or life aspirations and how would you decide what career to pursue. And people would advise uh, y- young people and students to say, "Well, okay, maybe uh, you know, look to your values to see what's really going to matter to you." Um, but that method, like the one I just mentioned, that uh, people like Shalom Schwartz use, still rely on this abstract rating and saying, "Okay, here's here's an ideal." like helpfulness, uh, how important is, is it to you? And then we, we do some maths to calculate an average across several values that are similar, and then we give people a score. Now, uh, where I, I think my interest started is to say, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, it's interesting people agree with them. It's also interesting that people tend to have a hard time explaining why they agree with them. And it's also interesting these relative differences in values do predict things. So so people who uh, favor protecting the environment more, on average, will do more environmentally things. Uh, on average is an important 
qualifier there because there will always be specific exceptions. But um, so so this these values are interesting in how they relate to attitudes and behavior. But to me, the next step is to look more closely at that how because the abstraction in values, as you pointed out, means that there are there's a swath of different behaviors and attitudes that might be relevant to them. So with this protecting the environment example, many people care about it, think it's important to protect the environment. But when you look at associations between protecting the environment and any specific behavior, like whether or not people have bought uh, low energy light bulbs, generally their correlation will be weak to null in many cases. That you, you won't necessarily see a strong association between that value and that very specific behavior. Where the patterns emerge is when you aggregate across a lot of different attitudes and behaviors that are relevant to the value. So how much do people um, tr travel less by car, perhaps um, you know, uh, you, you you use less energy or turn off light bulbs, et cetera. So we, generally in past research, we've seen you have to do some aggregation in order to have a chance for these values to show any kind of predictive validity. But to me, that begs another question. It begs a question about how do all these specific exemplars, these specific instances combine to create, if you will, the abstract ideal that we have in our heads that we're so passionately attached to? Uh, that that people will 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 defend vigorously and its peers go to war over you know uh, you know what how do we what is that aggregate because for instance in one study we did a couple of years ago we asked people about examples they associate with protecting the environment in several different countries and when we asked people in Brazil conserving water came up quite frequently when you ask people in England that doesn't come up at all. Uh, and, and actually, we had, we had plenty of water uh, in England and Wales. So I think uh, I think perhaps that's part of it. But by, by the flip side was among our sample in Brazil, recycling did not come up. But in the UK, it was number one. But of course, that's partly due to the culture and the context and um, the availability of and promotion of recycling may differ between the two places. So. That's important to us because if we looked at associations between that, you know, the importance of protecting the environment and recycling behavior in both places, we should see different associations merely because people are not making the same links. So I think this is a long way of answering your question to say that where we're trying to go in the next steps is to, is to get from the abstract to the concrete. Because it's interesting that people agree on the abstract, but the next step is to start looking at where the cracks appear in the more concrete elements. Yeah, it's interesting that values are so important, right? Like you're saying, they're kind of, they're what you prioritize. They're the things you say that should guide the way that I conduct my life. And yet there are plenty of times where you'd see someone make a choice and you go, uh, <laughs> that doesn't look like it's necessarily in line with those values that you're so interested in, right? And so like I said, some of it could just be like, oh, this, I just don't even see this as value relevant. And I often think of this like in consumer behavior. You'd be like, I have certain values about what I think is important, but when I'm standing there in the aisle looking at this product, it just doesn't register the value to me. Like if I'm if I care about sustainability and environmentalism, and for whatever reason, I'm sitting in the store and I go, Oh, I need a toothbrush. That one looks great. And I it just doesn't appear to me like that would be at all related to environmentalism. Do, do we have any sense about like when our big abstract values come to bear on these specific concrete choices that people make? I think we're getting there. Uh, but I, th I think learning history is part of the part of the answer. So to use a concrete example, you, you mentioned, I think, toothbrush, um, you know, the uh, you know, you might have seen recently there are there are more wooden truth buses available, and I'd say for a long time many people wouldn't have thought of sustainability and buying toothbrushes so much unless it occurred to them that there's a lot of plastic, you know, in these things, and perhaps they might. But but as soon as the the new product comes out a wooden one, and it starts to appear in that context, then I think the potential there is for people to start making the association and to start thinking about that product in a, in a way that could now vary in sustainability, just like happened with coffee and other, other products that you might see uh, on the shelves. And uh, I think it's those, 
types of exposures that then give the chance for people to make those connections. Now, whether or not they actually do the more sustainable purchase or not is also influenced by other values potentially. And that's the other thing that a lot of, a lot of research values researchers like to focus on, which is that it's rarely just one value that has relevance in a, in a domain. It's, there are other values that will compete. Values like wealth or saving money, for instance. If the wooden toothbrush costs you five times as much, you might start to think twice about it. Um, so there are interesting questions about the trade-offs we make between different values. Uh, and there's been great research you know, over decades on trade-offs and and especially in areas like political context where people sometimes will reason about the trade-offs you have to make between values, but other times will ignore them. And I think in our individual judgments and behavior, uh, it's it's interesting how on an everyday basis, we sometimes will think about the trade-offs, but maybe other times uh, not. And presumably it has something to do with, like you said, it's these are values that lots of people agree with, but the real critical moment or, or real critical point is, do you prioritize this one over others, right? And so presumably that could help resolve some of those trade-offs. They go, well, all these values are important, but this is the one that I'm like all about. And I wonder about both that and do we have a good sense of where those come from? Can, how malleable are those? Are, are we sort of, do we burst into the world with our value priorities all set in order? <laughs> or, you know, in what ways are we adaptive to different environments or cultures or messages uh, from people telling us what we should prioritize? Well, I think the evidence that's looked at, for example, differences, uh, twin studies on attitudes and uh also some related evidence on values would align with the, the broad view that most of the differences we have are culturally determined or socially, socially and culturally determined. But it's not to say there isn't some physical or biological element, um, some, something that we are born with that does influence these. Uh, in the attitudes research, it, you know, it's been suggested that some of this happens with sheer simple vis physical differences between people, which by themselves carry significance in the mm. cultures that we're in. Uh, so for instance, if you're, you're taller and more athletic, uh, you might get treated differently than if you're not so, so tall and athletic. And that in turn may lead to attitudinal differences. But it's not that there was a gene that coded you for a particular type of conservatism. And I think it, we probably could uh, express some, expect some similarities with regard to values and that there, there may be a component like that. Certainly there are gender differences in values. So that partly of course aligns with that but also there are big social and cultural differences in how different genders are treated so that again aligns with the idea that there's probably a little bit of, of something that we're born with but there's a, a a hell of a lot that is part of our environment in terms of messages i mean can, can we deliberately try to manipulate values do we have evidence of this because sometimes when we think about values we talk about like framing your message to appeal to a value that someone already has, right? So the best you can do is hope that you can sort of take something that's just set in stone in a person's head and make your message resonate with it. But can we can we get people to be like, no, we should prioritize this, right? In the, and I think of it because you say it's people have a hard time explaining their values. <laughs> it, it also makes sense to me that it would be difficult to sort of present an argument for a value. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And we were, uh, I, you know, I was fascinated by this issue, you know, earlier on too in my career, there was some, there was some work by uh, William McGuire in the 1960s that I was really inspired by, which looked at the idea of, of truisms, that there are cultural truisms out there, like, you know, penicillin has been a boon to humankind or back to toothbrushing. It's a good idea to brush your teeth every day. Um, now, he, he found that when you, when you look at beliefs like that, people often couldn't explain or justify why they believe that this was the case, but they'd agree very highly. But if you gave them a brief paragraph or two of arguments against these, they, would, they could quickly reverse position very, you know, very fast. As soon as they found something that said the, the, you know, the American Dental Association believes that your tooth enamel is damaged by brushing twice daily or something, beliefs change. Now, that was many years ago. I doubt 
I doubt the same truisms exist today. Uh, but I was curious whether that's the case with values um, because people are so passionately attached to them that, yeah, maybe they can't think of reasons why a particular value is important, like really, really good arguments, let's say. But they might stay attached to them nonetheless. They're really emotionally attached to these ideas. So even if you can't think of exactly why it's important, you're not going to give it up. You're not going to change views on it simply because you get some, you know, even two-page message that gives eloquent attacks against the value. Anyway, we tried that at one point a while back, early 2000s. And um, uh, what I did was it was very kind of skeptical study or just I thought, okay, I'm going to try to write some paragraphs attacking the value of equality. I thought people were going to really attach to that. So let's just see what we can come up with. And took some examples about issues that were playing out in the time about hiring and, and quotas, et cetera, and started writing a, a couple pages in that. Gave, it to, gave them to participants um, and had measures of the value of equality after this message in a group that would get it or uh, there was a control group that didn't. And I was really surprised that this message changed ratings of the value of equality a, a great deal. I mean, I can't remember the exact numbers. It was a while ago, but the the scale movement was something like uh, 30%, you know, 30 to 50%. So it was it wasn't just that they nudged over a bit from the message. They, they moved quite a bit after this message. And, you know, you, you know, I thought if they just were nudged over slightly, it would have been interesting, but, you know, really need to look at it a, a lot more. But the fact that there was such movement was uh, reminiscent to some degree of what McGuire had found with these other truisms. And so we then looked at whether you could give people arguments like this rebut the arguments or encourage them to rebut the arguments and then see similar effects of, of counter value attacks later. And we found that in line too with what McGuire had found, if you gave people an opportunity to just think and contemplate about the values beforehand, to think about you know counter attacks or think about arguments and supported them, then later on when they see these new, new messages, new messages attacking the value, they're less convinced. It's like they've convinced themselves they can do it, they can defend the value, and, and there's no movement then at that point. But other research, not, not, our, not in our own lab, but other, other research later, um, I think took things significantly a step further. For example, finding that uh, if you did change people's values uh, on a particular topic, you would change a variety of related attitudes related to that value. So in fact, finding that you could change the attitudes more easily by attacking the value than by, than by trying to directly at, uh, address the, the attitude itself. And you know, I, I think that's a remarkable finding as well. Then there's other research that's looked at values longitudinally and found that people, when they enter new life contexts, uh, tend to change their values over time. So for instance, entering a new field of study or a new job role, um, and that's interesting because unlike the other studies I've just mentioned, which were looking at short-term value change, this was looking at longer-term value change. And in theory, you need repeated exposure to different experiences that challenge your values to really get that persistent change over time. Whereas in, in the other studies, these were more um, possibly short-term effects of the messages that were given. We don't know because they, they weren't follow-ups uh, for those messages. In these kinds of settings, is it, uh, it's probably hard to know, but, but how much of it seems to be that I pull away from a value that I had versus I've just found a new value that in this moment seems to take priority, right? And so, again, I, I find it really compelling the way that we look at values in this relative sense, right? Because when we look at opinions, we just go, do you like this or do you not like this? Whereas value, and we less often are like, okay, well, of all these wonderful things, which do you like the most? Because we go that for those specific kinds of opinions, that perspective doesn't make as much sense. But for values, it does. We go all of these are they're on my shelf of values <laughs> that I, I think are important. But I have one of those values that sits on my desk, mm -hmm. let's say. Right. And I go, this is the one that is, is really the one that's going to guide my my choices mm -hmm. and so it's not that i'm getting rid of values on my yeah, shelf yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just that i'm swapping them out for what's on my desk so i'm curious if if we have any sense of which of those is driving these changes i i think you summarize it perfectly i think that 
what is happening is we're shifting our priorities. It's not that we abandon other values. It's that we we lean more towards some and then we deprioritize others. And part of the reason why I say that is we had one experiment where, where we d- did an intervention that changed values. And we found that when you increase the importance to a particular set of values, then values that were motivationally uh, opposing those values went down in importance. So it, it was as though people are making trade-offs in their mind. They're shifting the priorities and the balance between the values. But the other, the, the motivationally opposing values didn't become unimportant. They just became a, a little bit less important. So uh, to give you an example, if we, if we gave people an intervention that made it more important to them to be helpful and forgiving of, forgiving of others, so in other words, to transcend their own needs to think about others' well-being, then values that involve putting the self first, like achievement and wealth, tended to decrease in importance following that intervention, so suggesting there is a bit of a seesaw that people are maintaining. But there, you, you raise the question of which is happening more, you know, to, to what extent is it, it really about sort of shifting one set up and simultaneously equally to, to another degree decreasing others? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know that, that we do and in fact i'd like to say it's probably more whichever value is in focus but i vaguely remember that trends we saw suggested that it it, it might even happen more on the opposing side so uh so mm-hmm. it might be but it was very weak so i don't know i think is the answer i think i think it would be an interesting question to pursue further earlier on you you mentioned these motivations so so what does that mean you know, I, my impression is a lot of the psychology of values has been super focused on how these values clump together and how they're organized in in some sort of way, and and motivation is one of is one of the tools that has been used to to understand that. So, could you just sort of walk through what we mean by motivations that are relevant to values and and what that information gives us? Yeah. So the the most Don, I'd say the most influential perspective on this was uh, described by Shalom Schwartz in studies that have been carried out in over 80 different nations ar- around the world. And his model describes four broad categories of motivation that are expressed by values. And uh, one of them is, like I just mentioned, about transcending your own personal interest to consider the welfare of others. Um, another a uh, set of motivations is to pursue your own interests in in uh, in whatever directions you you deem appropriate. Um, then there's a, a a second pair of values, which sorry, not second pair of values, but there's another set of values which involve following your own intellectual and emotional interests in uncertain directions. These are what he calls openness values, and then there are values that have to do with protecting the status quo. Uh, what he labels conservation values. And these would involve concepts like national security or politeness or humility, anything that kind of subjects one's own needs to the social order. Now, he arranges all of these, the values in a circle to show their competing motivational orientations. And those are examples of the motivations described in that model, which I say has been, that model has been well supported in many nations around the world. There are other perspectives. I think there are other Other motives that you could potentially see as being aligned with other values that don't necessarily fall in that model. For instance, you know, there's debate from time to time about, well, what would you call a value? Is is this model, you know, comprehensive? Does it include every value that's under the sun? So his model is 56, uh, a core initial list of 56 values, which has since been reduced to a smaller number. But there's always debate about whether or not there could be more. And I think the abstraction within values makes it quite plausible that, yeah, we we haven't uncovered all the values that exist. And I'd say that actually we could use other models within personality to tap other motivations as well. So these mo- the, the idea of motivations, the, as you describe them, they kind of sound like super values because it, it strikes me as very similar to the difference between values and the attitudes that they inspire. So what's to stop us from saying, well, really, it's self-transcendence is that's the value. <laughs> and sure, it's associated with these other things that are in pursuit of that. But you you kind of give exactly the same analysis to, oh, these are the range of preferences that are in pursuit of this value. 
I think for theoretical precision, you probably need to to use terms like you just said, super values or higher order values. <laughs> uh, because yeah, I, I think on one level, you're right. It, it's kind of like any cognitive concept we have. There can be different levels of abstraction and we can decide what's the natural level. Where, where What's the point where we want to call this a value versus something else? And I think this, the idea of self-transcendence values is more abstract even than helpfulness, which is abstract by itself, or than forgiveness. And these concepts like helpfulness and forgiveness Forgiveness are more abstract than other abstract terms that could be subsumed within them, like family forgiveness, for instance, for you know, versus um, uh, international forgiveness in, in, for example, other other nations that might have been aggressing against one's own. So, um, so these issues with abstraction—that's part of why I feel this is so important that we understand these interlinkages, because you you, you really it, it's your your interest as a researcher or a practitioner that determines what level you're looking at. But the history of the research on values has kind of settled on this particular level I was just describing, at least as a tool for trying to understand more about how they influence us in our opinions. You've noted that um, values tend to be pretty tied to emotion. Is that yeah. is that right? Or And what kind of evidence do we have that that, that is the case? Well, in some data we collected way back when we asked people to list their reasons for their values and we asked them to rate feelings that they associated with values, we could see really high relations between the feelings that people gave and the value importance, but very little connection between their their reasons and the value importance when we were coding them. There, was, there were connections, but it wasn't nearly as strong. That's some data anyway. But I think... I think to to be frank, I don't think a lot of researchers really examine that particular research question closely because I think we've been more or less taking it for granted or just assuming it because you look around you in the world outside and you see people argue over these abstract concepts pretty passionately and you start to feel like, oh, there is an emotional connection. The only trick is how much does that outweigh the rational one or not outweigh, but how much does it dominate? And that's a tricky question to answer. So our the, the little kind of correlational design I, I just described is one way of maybe answering that question. But in some ways, it's like app comparing apples and oranges. And, you know, it's difficult to come up with a metric to say, oh, yeah, yeah, now we can definitely say it's more emotional rather than more cognitive. Um, to some extent, in, you know, there are designs like we could look at whether or not people are more influenced by emotional messages than fairly rationally directed messages at their values. And that might help to answer the question. But but yeah, I think that still needs to be done. I get the same impression from the work on moralized opinions, which is obviously what I, I do a lot of work in. And there's often this like, oh, of course, they're super emotional. But, you go, but we've never really like, what's the, <laughs> why do they have to be? It, it just kind of feels like it's this way of talking about moral values where you go, and of course, they're very emotional. But like you say, you go, well, we don't have a great like true, that could be totally right, but we don't have a perfect sense of how right it is. And I think part of it is driven by the like, well, if they're not rational, then they must be emotional, right? Because like you said, when you ask people to explain themselves, they have a hard time. And I, I'm curious why, right? So from like a moral psychology standpoint, some of that explanation is, well, if people can't explain themselves, therefore, they're using just gut intuitive emotions to, to think about their values. But is there any other way <laughs> that we could think about, like how could we get these things that are so important that we agree on that drive um, important choices that we try to make that when push comes to shove, we, we really can't explain why they're important? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I am reminded you, you mentioned moral de decisions and judgment and, you know, there's work on moral dumbfounding by Jonathan Haidt, from uh, which is very similar to the work we've done in in some respects on values as functioning as truisms, where people lack uh, arguments for them. Except the, a big difference is that uh, he cleverly designed these scenarios, which removed one by one logical bases for people to object to various moral wrongs, and and was still left with evidence that people were emotionally uh, objecting to these. To these uh, issues, uh, like there were, you know, 
you know, there are various various moral behaviors that he looked at which would make people feel disgust and and people ne- couldn't necessarily explain why they would feel disgust at this behavior like i think one example is having uh, sex with a dead chicken you know and and you could sort of cleverly take out all the wrongs, the, the, the utilitarian negative consequences of this and still show that feeling of disgust. What's different in the values context is we're looking at these positively judged ideals where we're not, we're not looking at asking people to justify those positive emotions when you suddenly give them all these anti, anti reasons, um, <laughs> which we could potentially do. Maybe that is something we need to, but we haven't, we haven't done anything analogous to the dumbfounding. The, the limit is well, the, the method so far has been asking people to just justify these values. And then what we find them saying is things like, well, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about it before. I think, Helpfulness is important because we should help others. God says we should help others, and that's really important to me. And I think we should help others because that's what I learned as I was growing up, and that's my family. And and all these things that that psychologically are very meaningful to people. I'm not taking away from the, the, the psychological substance of that. It's just that when you look at those reasons, you have troubles. You still want to know more. You still want to say, okay, so why? Why did your family say that helpfulness is important? <laughs> Um, and eventually you do get, people do give reasons and they come up with things like, uh, oh, because if I help, maybe others will help me. But then sometimes they go a step further and say, oh, I wonder then why, you know, where's the chicken or the egg? Like, which came first? Do they help me or do I help them? And, and people can tie themselves up in knots a bit because it seems evident that it's not been given much prior thought. It's, it also seems that it's a reason why it's tricky to have conversations with people who disagree because they're prioritizing different values, right? And you go, to explain to me why it's this is more about equality than it is about this other mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. right? And and you go, yeah, I can't explain. Just, I just know <laughs> that it's important that we pursue equality and this is the way to do it. And someone else goes, yeah, but tell me why we should pursue equality. And, and in some ways, <laughs> I wonder if you run into problems where if you ask for an explanation of a value that this person goes, everybody has this value, right? <laughs> that you look like a terrible person for, for wanting a rational reason to value something that seems like everyone should value it. Yeah. I, I mean, on our in our experiments, the people are just giving these responses as individuals anonymously. So we're trying to do it in a sense where there's no judgment of them for this, but to, to, of course they can bring that judgment internally. So they internalize the feelings of the society and think, well, I'd be a bad person if I felt otherwise. And actually we've done some data collection where we look at that. We ask people about how much they ideally would ha- hold a value versus think they ought to hold that value. And there is a, hor- there is a high correspondence between those two judgments. But uh, in the West, the ideal tends to dominate. So we, we find people really overwhelmingly feel like that what they're reporting is the I personal ideal to them and, and a little bit less of what's, mm. what's the, um, the obligation or standard that their society suggests they should hold. But uh, that said, I think it's difficult for us to disentangle the two. We're brought up in particular environments where we think of different values as having a priority. But then then I think the example you're raising is, well, if a particular issue becomes salient, one value might really jump to the fore. And we think, well, of course, this is about equality, or now this is about freedom. And to me, that's where a lot of these debates come in. And that's where I'm really interested in this potential for values to not to, to bridge across the divide. Now that may sound odd because we're just talking about how people come up to dip with different values for different sides of an issue. But what would be nice is if people could take a further step back, ignore the issue, and just say now in the abstract, do the opposing view, do the opposing parties on this topic agree about this ideal? So do they both agree that equality is hmm. important? In an, in an abstract way. Do they both agree freedom is important or whatever values are presumably being contest, contested? And if they do, as, as we found most often they do, like when we look at various groups around the world in, in recent data, we found huge amounts of value similarities between groups. There are differences, but they, they pale in comparison to the amount of similarity. So it makes you wonder, if you point out that similarity, before the issue comes up, before people make assumptions about 
the huge ways in which they differ in their values, then, then you can put the values in a context. You can say, okay, so you, you agree about these values in general, but when it comes to this particular issue, what is it now that changes? Is it, is it now that this value is more or less important to you in the abstract, or is it that you just don't think it's relevant here in this situation? And, uh, you know, I think that's so true today. It's still very true today, but it begs the question of what happens if you can point out the overlap, the fact that, as we found, that in the abstract, people do share values more than they think they do. Um, so I'm curious whether or not, once you point that out, can people start to bridge the divides a little bit by looking a little bit more at the specifics? Yeah, by, by way of, of maybe wrapping up, I was thinking that this transitions into a, a recent paper. I, I didn't notice it when it came up, probably, I mean, very recently, on y thinking about values in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. It sort of concludes with this this notion that values are well placed to be a tool of intervention for a health crisis like this and so i'm curious for both that if you could sort of explain a little bit what what the the goals of that article were and then more generally like what are the possibilities of using values as a tool in interventions in ways that are hopefully fingers crossed to, to accomplish some good in the world so uh i mean that that article was really a about trying to extend that uh, idea about value similarities into this context to say that in this context, even though people may have very different views about lockdowns, about responses to the pandemic, there will often still be a lot of similarity about the basic values that people hold. And the most important values to most people are very self-transcending in nature. So they're very helpful, forgiving uh, in their orientation. And that's true for people even that you might expect to be feeling otherwise. So people who are imagined as being on the very right end of the, the spectrum are usually seen as only being concerned about themselves. Whereas actually still, when you look at values measures, that those, those very self-transcending values are, will be very high on their list, roughly perhaps equal to the other values, but not necessarily lower in most cases. We have to work very hard to find people who don't put those values uh, near the top of the list. So with that kind of finding in mind, it makes us believe that when it comes to trying to get a collective action in favor of some common interest like stemming a pandemic, reminding people of these shared values can have value. Uh, sorry, so we use the <laughs> word. But uh, yeah, it, you know, it, reminding them of this can actually give a basis for agreement and for people to have a starting point to say, yeah, okay, we, we all agree with these ideals. Okay, now if we can all agree on those ideals, the next step is what do you agree about the being the mechanism to do this? You know, what is the most helpful thing? What is the thing that is the greatest, you know, broad benefit? Personally, I feel like that's where a lot of the issues start to arise and the divisions start to come about because we don't tackle that point. We, we, we start, to start to make assumptions that people's values are very different. We grow the division between them rather than saying, okay, maybe they're the same, but we are disagreeing perhaps legitimately on, on different means or we have different facts uh, at our, in our understanding and that's what's causing the confusion. But I think uh, sometimes in our emotional response to the other side, you know, we think, oh, you know, geez, there's so, you know, I so much disagree with them. So then we project these opposing values when it's maybe not to our advantage to do that. What we should be doing is is coming to grips with the alternative beliefs um, that people have and how they're playing a role. Well, great. Well, fingers crossed that, that <laughs> that'll that'll turn into into something. I just want to say thanks for taking the time to, to talk about your work. Uh, and and yeah, always, always fun to talk to you. Boy, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk about this work. So thanks. Thanks very much. That'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Thank you so much for listening in. As always, check out the show notes for links to the things we talked about, along with a full transcript. Subscribe to Opinion Science anywhere you get podcasts, and follow the show on social media, at OpinionSciPod. Check out OpinionSciencePodcast.com for everything else you could possibly want in this world. 
And hey, if you're enjoying the show, learning new things about public opinion and communication, and you're willing to spend a few seconds to help the show, leaving a nice review on your favorite podcast platform is not only nice to see for me, but also helps other people find us. Okie doke, that's it for now. I'll see you in a couple weeks for more opinion science. Bye-bye. Thank you.